Were you guys familiar with steel guitar before this project? Kelsey, you want to take that? I can take that one first. <laughs> Actually, that's how Nathan and I met. We both were learning the steel guitar from our mentor. His name is Roger Miller, who's actually in the film. And uh, that was about, what, 10 years ago we met or 12 years ago? 2010, I'd say. Nathan and I met. We both were learning steel guitar. And um, a couple of years after that, we got together and said, so I, I do uh, videography work and I have my own production company. So I had all the equipment and I've always wanted to make a documentary. And I can let him talk a little more about what he's done. But he, a music journalist who has a background in getting really good interviews and so we thought hey we have different talents we can combine as a way to do something about the steel guitar that we're both super passionate about there are obviously scenes of that classroom of that way of getting the voice out for a steel guitar because it is a, a guitar that a isn't easiest to play it's different than most people think of how to play something plus it's expensive yeah can y'all talk a bit about the importance of it being taught because it is almost a dying art form it, i mean that was the whole point of the film our mentor was giving us lessons for free the whole point was more people needs to be like him, I mean, I, people deserve to get paid. You need to make a living. Um, but people need to be able to take chances. Uh, the instrument's expensive, so not many people can buy an expensive instrument and then realize that they're not very good at it because they don't have instructors or just they don't like it. Um, for me, I know that it was a matter of getting comfortable behind it before I, you know, I was afraid of it. Once I was no longer afraid of it, then I could kind of figure it out. But not having a mentor, not having many resources. I mean, we have the internet today, but it's, not, yeah. it, it's still a lot of it went over my head. The, the instrument taught me music theory. I'll be the first one to admit that. I didn't know any of that. So um, yeah, people just need to know it about the instrument too. They have to know that it exists. So that was why we made the film exactly. The second part of your title, I think, is very important, that sound. There isn't really anything like it. It's mostly thought of for one genre, yet you can take it out of that genre and it sounds amazing, but it's just not that well done, or not that w it hasn't been done a lot. Um, can you tell us about that sound and why it is special to you and why you think it's special to so many other people? I'll, I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> um, I just, I love the instrument all around. Uh, it, it's fascinating to look at it, but also the sound of it just, it, it weirds me out. I, I, that's the only way to say it. Like, it, it haunts me. It sounds, I heard someone say it sounds like God crying. Um, I love that. And yeah, I, that really speaks to me. Um, but I, I love playing mood, playing soundscapes. Um, you know, ethereal stuff. That's where I think it really speaks to people. Singer songwriters, um, but it can be used in jazz, rock, obviously, um, blues. But, um, you know, we were talking to Dev and, about it, and I was talking to somebody else, and they said that I've never heard these steel guitar sound bad. <laughs> and we're like, well, it can. You should, you should hear me sometime, <laughs> you know? But, um, yeah, it, it's just a very elusive instrument, especially when the notes are bending. Um, it, that, that sound gets me, so. And for me, what I really love about playing the steel guitar and hearing someone who also has that passion for it is that there's so much emotion that you can evoke, and um, which can happen in a slide guitar too, but there's something about, especially with the pedal steel guitar that we both play, where you can bend notes in a certain way that other instruments just can't do. And um, holy people get from the film, it, it kind of creates this bond and a community around the instrument because people who get it, whether or not they play it, they just have seen it and they like it. When they get it, they get it and they're obsessed. There's no like, oh, the steel guitar, that's cool. It's it's people are all in once they, they get it. So our biggest hope is that people see this film and, and get that bug and maybe they just see one out once when they go out and about and they see a steel guitar and like, hey, I know what that is or they seek it out and we just hope people start to see the value and the emotional connection and, and what music can do for people in general. I know it's kind of a convoluted answer, but... <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Nathan, when you first brought it up when we were talking last night, um, you brought up the point that when you think of it, you only think of old white guys playing this, that it's very much that's why it's a dying art form. Your film showcases that it is a little bit more diverse. There is also the element of people wanting to teach it. How important is it to document something like this and to introduce it to people who may not know that it can be played by anyone? It doesn't matter who plays it. It's just it has this history of certain people doing it. Well, uh, I, I, I'll let Kelsey speak to this a little bit better. Um, but just to be real quick, I mean, it, it's an instrument, you know. Um, and there's so much history to be covered with it. Obviously, it came from Hawaii, so it's a Hawaiian instrument. Um, and then we showcase some other stuff in the film um, that shocks some people. And it's like, why is this shocking? <laughs> you know? But... Um, yeah, I. The. It's music. It's art. You know, um, th and there is things that people. I'm gonna let Kelsey take over because I, I feel like I'm gonna uh, step on something. Like I, I don't want to, to offend anybody. Uh, it is hard as a yeah. older, but it's hard as a white male to speak on behalf of yeah. other people. <laughs> well, I, I just, I mean, I, I don't want to offend old white guys, you know. Um, oh, no, no, but we, they, yeah. They, yeah, they haven't um, advanced the instrument very much in the past 40 years, more. Uh, when the instrument first became pedal steel, there was guys just tinkering and tweaking it, and calling each other on the phone saying what they did and not hearing how they did it the same way as the other person's explaining it and they tried that at home and they messed it up and that's how the tuning was invented like the standardized tunings and now nobody plays different tunings so um, we need people with new ideas we need people with new cultures um, <laughs> playing with it and messing around with it t hopefully taking it apart <laughs> And turning into a, not a new instrument, but moving forward. So um, that's what we wanted to show. So yeah, I agree with you, Nathan. Um, I have nothing against older white guys playing instruments. It's, it's the key demographic. Um, but I think I'm very thankful to those um, who taught me, who happen to be older white men too, because uh, they saw the potential in me and the potential that I could do something different with this instrument. But uh, on the other hand, being a female playing this instrument, and I, I played in a band uh, for a couple of years, and I, so that's like my 12th year playing now, I still get people coming up to me, especially men who play the instrument, and saying, wow, you're really good for a girl steel player. And I kind of do want to get that point out there that um, and same with musicians in general like I don't see how my gender has anything to do with me as a, a steel player but I do also see that it's important that I play and kind of represent the fact that women can do this because there's just not a lot of women doing it at all and um, the women who do play are some of my best friends we've gotten close because of this instrument and it's also it's predominant in the African American community in a way different way which we touch on in the film that could be that's a whole nother documentary in itself but I, I think the main message I want to get across with this film in regards to diversity and the importance of diversity of genre diversity of thought diversity of people is that um, let me gather my thoughts here for a second I had a whole thing thought up here, but I'm, I'm not good at being on this side of the camera. Um, I'm like, I had this whole thought, and then it all just went over my head after eating. Okay, so I'll gather my thoughts here and let them edit this out. Um, gosh, I had his point. So I might as well be done. My, it's, it, I lost it. Sorry. I had this like I had this point here. I don't know if you can like follow up with me here to. Well, I'd love to, to. Your comment about you're good for a girl. Yeah. Some of the best guitarists, forget about steel guitar, guitarists right now are women. St. Vincent, to me, is one of the most underrated guitarists on the planet. 100%. And no one mentions it. They, you know, they don't, they don't talk about it, but people in the industry, like Pearl Jam brought her on because Eddie heard her guitar playing, not her music. I'm curious, how... How much importance is it that we're still dealing with this today? It's not yeah. 40 years ago. Today, we still don't clarify the difference that who cares who's playing it as long as it's good. Exactly. I, I love what you just said there. I think uh, so back in the 60s and 70s, especially in country music, 
there weren't just singers, there were singers and there were girl singers. And I think that kind of attitude has kind of kept being perpetuated. And uh, to this day, like I said, when I go on a stage and I, they assume I'm a singer, I can't sing at all. <laughs> they assume I sing That's that's and they assume I know nothing about how to set anything up or music or audio. And I run a video and audio production company. So it's just breaking those barriers of assumption. I get people aren't used to seeing women doing this. So that's why it's important that our film and other people just see it and that's what when I play I'm not here to say like oh look at me I'm a girl playing this but I think it's just I don't want to be known as that but I'm fine if that inspires one girl to pick up an instrument or do something she didn't think she could do how did you guys come across your interviews and some of the wonderful people you got to talk to this is Nathan question for sure Um, there's a lot. Yeah. Of uh, th- thank you. I mean, we, we just spent some time. Um, a lot of people that didn't make it, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's a few people that didn't make it, but um, uh, there's a few people that we interviewed that didn't make the film. So we have tons of extra footage. Uh, we, sequel. We, we knew, <laughs> what's that? A sequel. Yeah, sequel. yeah. Uh, we knew we couldn't make the film without um, Sacred Steel with the African-American churches. Um, that, that couldn't happen. Uh, so we did that. But I, I really, I just found ways to reach out to the people I looked up to and that I knew other steel players looked up to and um, maybe some youth could look up to. So that was you what You get amazing was important. response. Yeah. It's amazing what happens when you just yeah. reach out. I mean, it, yeah. it's a small subculture <laughs> of musicians, you know. Um, it, people say it's the musician's musician. Mm-hmm. Um, people that play pedal steel. But, you know, once you can kind of learn the lingo, it's like a secret society. But if you can kind of know the lingo, it's like code. Like, all right, I want to talk to you now. But what do you know about steel guitar? You know, and just having that conversation, that's kind of the way that we tried to do interview interviews. That's the way I like to do interviews, just have a conversation like we're doing right now. Um, and obviously, we kind of knew what we wanted to do with the film, but <laughs> it changed a lot. And, uh, and Kelsey and I kind of balanced each other out. Um, Roger and Kathy in the film, they're kind of like, they always call us their son's daughter. Mm. So uh, it's kind of funny in that sense that we were able to like constructively make the film. And I don't think there was anything that we really um, battled on like with making the film. Maybe we'd ask a question like, why do you think this? Why do you think that? Yeah, and then we'd, we'd figure out how to make it. So it's almost like I would have made a different film. She would have made a different film. <laughs> Who knows what it would have been. Um, but yeah, the, the people that we interviewed, I, that's was your question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna love editing this. Uh, the, the, the people that we interviewed kind of started out with who was available. Who came through who Iowa. Who came through yeah. Iowa. And then I knew to get some of the people I wanted to talk to, we had to travel um, to Nashville. It all kind of started with Buddy Cage mm-hmm. oh, yeah. inside there. So I'm a huge jam band guy. Um, so. When I first started New Riders Purple Sage, I thought Jerry Garcia was playing all the cool stuff. <laughs> His buddy Cage. Um, so I was setting up an interview with him and then um, got to follow them for a couple shows, hang out with the band. And Not too bad. Yeah, and Kelsey's like, well, hey, you, we talked about doing something. I, I think we can do it. And immediately we just jumped on it. There seemed to be an excitement from the people you interviewed, like Buddy, that yeah. they finally got to tell someone about, I've been doing this stuff for a long, long time. How much fun was it unearthing their stories? Because I don't think all of their tales have been told. <laughs> no, and in fact, like, so Buddy Cage has passed, since passed away uh, almost two years ago now. And in fact, I kind of wish we could have done, a, could have told the story more, but obviously this film wasn't about, just about Buddy Cage. So, you know, you have to pick and choose what you tell. But um, there are so many hidden, there's so many people out there that just get looked over. And I think it, it's really important that we were able to talk with them and, let them know we do appreciate them it's and I think that's an important message for anybody to realize like 
if, in filmmaking, one thing you can do is make people feel special because you care about them and care about what they're talking about. And weirdly enough, a lot of people don't get that. And it's, it's kind of sad. I don't think if you anything you wanted to add to that. But. Um, I mean, kind of hit the head, nail on the head there. Um, Bruce Bowden, I mean, he, he's got all types of stories. He was really important in the music in the 90s, the country music in the 90s. And okay, somebody can make story about Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I want to tell a quick story about <laughs> filming with him. Um, so he was playing with Garth Brooks uh, back, when did we film that? This is So we've been working on this film for eight years, so it's hard to keep track of the exact timeline, because also some people we interviewed in 2014, some we interviewed in 2018, so it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of my head. But whenever we saw him is when Garth Brooks was kind of re- starting to go tour out again so it was actually it was a big big deal and we got in and they gave us like 15 minutes on the stage and so I'm like setting up my camera in a light as fast as I possibly can and then they, they decided they would um, I don't know they, the people running the stage thought it'd be fun to like spin the stage in a circle huh. so my gears like spinning around in a circle I'm trying to get my lob my bills going. yeah it's like it's like a so it's like a we're watching the gear move away. yeah and I'm like trying to get my tripod up and then we're, I'm having audio issues and I think I think it was intentional that they were like sending this weird signal out so I couldn't use a wireless lav so I was like trying to do something and then and then everyone's getting like well you only have like five minutes and I'm like well it's not gonna do us a lot of good if we don't have any audio <laughs> so we um we I'm just amazed at what we were able to pull off considering like yeah looking back I wish we could have done things a lot more professionally or shot this way or that way but it was it was gorilla it was like you get 10 15 minutes you run you do this and um I'm really proud that we we're able to pull off what we did because it's it's fun to think of all the stories behind every interview and we have a story behind everyone. But Garth Brooks and Bruce Bowen is probably my favorite because it was like they were just like, we're going to mess with these people. And they were shooting off like weird noises and fog machine. Fog machine and it was <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to tell that story because that was fun. Yeah, yeah that's a fun <laughs> one. But uh, t- t- to your point, um, when, when we met with uh, Buddy Cage again yeah. for the, the actual interview for the film, uh, to- Captain Toast, he's the tour manager, bus driver, he wears all the hats for the band, and he, he thanked us. He's like, this is the kind of stuff that keeps these kind of musicians going and mm-hmm. doing it still. And that that meant the world for me. Because um, Buddy is the reason why we made the film. What does it mean to get into a festival like Oxford that knows music docs, knows the southern gothic feel of so much of the music of this era, Um, so many people connected to Nashville also. I'm curious, being in the South with this film, it's got a real special, not to take it away from Iowa, the way you guys have done, but... But no, there's not. (laughs) I think it's important you open here. That's kind of perfect. I mean, it's the whole reason why we're here. Uh, Oxford has respect for music docs. When we tell people that we made a rock doc, there's certain people on certain coasts <laughs> who kind of laugh, snarl, scoff, um, and you know we, we try to make something more than just a rock doc. You know we wanted to tell Roger's story. We wanted to influence people to teach whatever their passion is: woodworking, sports. You know, um, so, and music's important. Art's important. You know, um, I actually once had somebody tell me that documentary isn't art. This is like my freshman year of college, of a community college, and some filmmaker came through, and I asked him a question about documentary. And he goes, "Documentary isn't art." You, you can imagine uh, th- that was an argument. That what I, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it's important that there's festivals like Oxford that want to have music documentaries. <laughs> And they're not calling it a rock doc. I mean, um, it's great because you're pulling at different emotions, you know. You can kind of teach somebody, and that's something that we really wanted to do too. We both agreed upon. We don't want to throw things in your face because telling somebody something is propaganda. And we want people to come out with their own narrative and hopefully feel the same way that we were trying to feel ourselves when we made it so um yeah i have seen so many good documentaries yeah a lot of good ones here <laughs> 
feel really honored and thankful to Oxford and it, something about this just feels really special and the connection to music. Um, we just watched another documentary that got to premiere here as well and I, I could just feel how special it was for them and for the music and something about music and the culture that comes around it. Cause music isn't just like one thing to me. It, it creates community, it creates culture and I can sense that in this whole, there's a, the film community, the Oxford community, it all comes together and it, and it makes something special. So I, f I feel like this is the best choice we possibly could have had for a premiere and I'm, I'm really thankful. I think there's, to tie into Nathan, there's a quote, I think it's Morgan Neville who's a documentary filmmaker said, he likes doing music documentaries because it's a good way to like hide in an important message but make it like tolerable. It's not his words, but basically make something that's really entertaining and really enjoyable because people love music, but you can have mess put a message through as like kind of hidden in there. It's kind of eating your vegetables, you know, but putting some really good sauce on it. So that's what I think about music documentaries and why I love them. I'd love someone to tell Morgan it's not art. He's only like... <laughs> Jeez. I, know, I was looking at, I, I saw that quote and made me laugh about his. Because uh, actually, uh, t have you seen 20 Feet? Everyone's seen 20 Feet from Sardom. That's actually, that film is actually what got me thinking about how to structure our film. Because mm. it was like, well, how do we do a documentary about not really a person? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of weird. So like his being about background singers, it was about people. Like ours about steel players. But he, he the way he structured it, I really liked. So, or, you know, not just him, but. Guys, um, how can people find out more about that thing, that sound, but also for you and how they can find out more about you guys? Oh, uh, well, we have a website, thatthingthatsound.com. Um, we have an Instagram. I believe it's that.sound. Wait, no. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So thatthingthatsound.com. <laughs> and then that dot thing underscore that dot sound instagram we're on facebook um but if you go to the website you can sign up to our mailing yeah. list that's the best idea um we've been updating um more and more now that it's finally out <laughs> it seems like before we'd up give an update and then people start asking when is the film coming out it's like oh, just that's all the update we have ourselves <laughs> so um yeah, we're excited for some future stuff. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Nathan M. Emerson. Um, I, I do liquid light projections, which I'd love to talk about sometime. I think I talked with you about that, Definitely. maybe. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, the experimental stuff is fun. Uh, that's the best spot to find me, probably. Kelsey, where can we find you? Yes, I am also on Instagram. I'm getting bad. I'm not that good at posting on social media, but it's a good way to find and connect with me at Kelsey Hammer hyphen parks on Instagram. Uh, also on Facebook, as well as my production company's website is KelseyHammer.com. If you're interested in hiring me for something, I don't know what that, but um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm pitching that. But uh, anyway, yeah, so you can just find me on Instagram at Kelsey Hammer parks or on Facebook under my name as well. Thank you guys for making this film. <laughs> I'm getting choked up. It's so emotional. Um, but also for loving that instrument. It's helped, I think, get the word out and help maybe others find out about that instrument. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks for doing this with us. Really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you.